Stanford University. Dick, I'd like to ask you just a few more questions about uh, you know, the combining of the men's and women's tennis program back in 1975. Um, in approximately September of 75, Ann Hill uh, is hired to replace Curly Neal as a women's tennis coach. Can you tell us about that? You know, why was Cur why did Curly step why was Curly stepping down and things? Yeah, like Curly that? was a, a very good friend of ours, and and uh, Ann played for her, and I knew her uh, very well respected. Uh, great physical educator, tennis was especially a very good tennis player. But Curly did not want to take it into the next level of ultra competitiveness and was re reticent to do so. So I think she probably would have had that opportunity if she had wanted. Um, uh, I was asked who I felt might do a good job. I don't know that we actually did a formal search. I, know that I don't remember doing that the next time for Anne's success we did. But I was asked who I thought, and immediately I thought of Ann and, and approached her and said, you know, is this something you would consider? I think you'd be really good. And um, she thought about it and, and spoke to her husband about it and, and uh, decided she would try that. And ironically, uh, after the first three years, she just wasn't liking it. Uh, it didn't give her the satisfaction that she thought it would. and, and the year after she won the national championship, I talked her into coming back a fourth year. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I realized it just wasn't right for her. And in her four years, she was never worse than second in national, nationally and the uh, one national championship in 78. But, but I think coaching is for a certain kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, I love the thrill of facing each day where someone's on this page and you think he should be on this page or maybe is up here and you're down here you have a different you face a different a different day every day it's always different and it can go like this and the coaching situation can go like this from match to match and I love that thrill I love the thrill and the challenge of trying to find what button to push with a guy in a certain day or what to do how to adjust everything after a tough loss or this kind of thing, building a, I, th I think in Ann's case, Ann's very much more level, key, even keel, and this was hard for her. It was hard for really, she was really close to the gals, but it was really hard for her to see someone on the court crying because something wasn't going well. It really hurt her. She cared so much for the gal, as an example, mm -hmm. and it just wasn't for her, and it, she finally convinced me after four years that it wasn't right, so that's when we had, went on a search and hired Frank Bennon. But she was very good at what she did, I thought. Well, I want to follow up on that. You know, she was, you know, her team, she's there for four years. She's the NCAA runner-up in 76 and 77, then wins the NCAA team championship in 78. How, in your view, look, observing, how did Ann achieve that success? What was it about her coaching or recruiting, or what was it? Well, it was the AIW then, which is the counterpart of the NCAAs, and, and I, I helped her a little bit. Uh, as I helped Frank, I mean, we were in the same office, five feet apart, and um, I think that, you know, I could help her in terms of identifying the gals. It was a brand new world for women's sports in. Stanford's one of the very few schools to embrace it immediately and combine the departments so it wasn't two separate worlds. It was as Cal, as an example, for a while. Uh, Stanford was quick on board, and it wasn't just tennis, although tennis was the first. The other sports came on very quickly as well. And I think that was because Stanford's 100% commitment from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some very good players who were out there who were eligible for admission, who were admittable. And, uh, and she was able to get those players. I know she worked really hard to get Pam Shriver, uh, who remains a good friend to us both to this day, but Pam was intent on turning pro. But there were some good players like Barbara and Kathy Jordan. Barbara was a semifinalist at Wimbledon. Kathy, uh, Barbara, excuse me, Barbara won the Australian Open in 79. She was her probably her first full scholarship player. Kathy was on a half scholarship. Kathy uh, was a semifinalist at Wimbledon. 
uh, Susie Hagee and Diane Morrison won the national championship twice in doubles. They really had some very, very good players in those days. Okay. And when this merger takes place in 75, you become the director of the combined program. No, not really. I, I was a men's coach and Ann was a women's coach. And okay. I, w I became the director of tennis only when I retired from coaching in 38. Okay, so you kept the... But the programs worked together so much with everything all the way through when Frank okay. Brennan and it was just really one program. And I, I was uh, really proud of that. It was the only sport here really except for maybe sailing. I think even their competitions are co-ed, but uh, really proud of that. Yeah. Uh, cross, cross country maybe is much the same now too. Right. Now you and Anna Mary got married in 1977, mm -hmm. and husband and wife working teams sometimes get mixed results. What was it like <laughs> you know, working with your wife? Well, I loved it. First of all, we go home, and, and we still do. Uh, we still talk about the day, and, and uh, we could talk about practice and what we did and what we did not. I, I don't think we've ever had a, a loud word or a disagreement in our 39 years of marriage. It's been wonderful. So working together for me was, I think both of us really enjoyed it and we continued to. Uh, we would do cruises together where we were lecturers. We would do, uh, we travel a lot, many times on business. Uh, she did a lot of presentations at places where I was presenting in those days. Um, it was, we shared a lot of things. It was really a special time. Okay. Um, after Ann leaves, mm -hmm. uh, there was a Frank Brennan takes her, it takes her place? Yes, we had a search committee. And, and really the big question for me being on that search committee, if you, if you really, if you really, really <clears throat> believe in Title IX, do you then not owe it to hire a woman as a coach? Mm -hmm and develop women's coaching in general. And that's something I still wrestle with today. There are probably more men coaching women's teams than there are women. But if you really are a believer in Title IX, it would appear to me you should hire a women's coach. What it got down to, and, and we had a couple of really strong women applicants, but what it got right down to in that meeting was the question of whether or not you hire the best coach for the girls, whether it be a man or woman. And Frank Brennan, uh, the committee felt, was probably the best applicant at the time. There were two other people who were very close, highly considered who were women. And my feeling, frankly, was that if you really believe in Title IX, you hire the woman and you help the profession. And I still believe that today. But Frank was the stronger person, most probably available, and uh, did get the job. And we work wonderfully together, very, very close friend. And again, in our close accommodations, it was, that, was, that was fortunate. And what sorts of, uh, over the years as you've been working with, with Ann at first and Frank, mm -hmm. what sort of issues would the men's coach, you, and the women's coach, Ann or Frank, you know, collaborate on, work together on, or how did you, uh, how was you, your, your working relationships in terms of division of duties? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, it was pretty easy. Uh, we would split up, uh, maybe one of us would take charge of the Thanksgiving trip, someone else would do the team dinner. Uh, it, 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 it was never a problem. I think I was very lucky because I worked really well with both of them. I didn't want to marry Frank. <laughs> but I, I don't think but he wanted <laughs> to marry you either. <laughs> That's for sure. But I think it was very easy. We had a nice definition. We'd sit down and talk about it and kind of share the responsibilities. But I think, and, and but most of them we did together. And I thought that was really a neat thing about the program. Yeah. In, in tennis, you know, these kids grow up. All the tournaments are co-ed, so they all the guys and gals all know each other from that. It just was a very easy, a very easy transition. Mm -hmm. Played mixed doubles, you know. We we would have uh, in Maples Pavilion. We'd have a mixed match with. We played a mixed match in Maples with USC. We did it regularly with Cal in Maples. We did. Uh, we played the Golden Gators World Team Tennis based in Oakland. We played them in Maples one year, uh, where men and women play on the same team. Team we. Uh, flew Trinity University out here, which had a great women's and men's program at the time. And we played a two-day match with them with men's singles on one court, women's on another, mixed doubles on the next one, all going on simultaneously. It was a circus, and it was really, really fun. Now, the women's program, both under and and, Fra and then mm -hmm. after Frank, has, had, has, it, has achieved many successes as well. What would you attribute yes. that to? Uh, well, first of all, I think Anne first and Frank secondly are very attractive coaches to to young people. Uh, if I were a parent, I can't think of anyone better than I would 
than working with either one of them. Lily Farood has carried this on. Her players love her and are very, very loyal to her. Frankie Brennan's son, Frank Brennan's son, Frankie, has been the associate head coach now for a number of years for, maybe he's worked with the program 21 years because he started as a volunteer coach for his dad, was Lily Farood's assistant. Um, but, but the success for the women's program has continued to go on and on and on. In fact, is now uh, the men's last championship with 2000, the women won it in 2016 as an example, they've continued to win. And I think that uh, uh, it's, it's just a very, very strong program. I'd like to move on to a slightly different topic. Um, when you joined Stanford in 1966 as the coach, had you developed a, a certain kind of coaching style and, you, and how would you describe it? And how has that coaching style changed over the years? That's a great question. Coaching styles have changed a great deal. Um, my basic style and, and my strength was to be proactive rather than reactive in terms of tactics and play. And so my emphasis was on serve and volley, getting net, making the other person react to you, whether it be off a return of serve, quickly off the ground, or on serve and volley. And that pretty much was a theme of the day, but I think we carried that to the extreme. Um, I believe in that most it made an interesting coaching teaching situation for me because you can't do that if you're 14 years old and four feet high. You have to reach, to reach a certain level of maturity to be able to do this, which happens to be about college age. And so, although many of these players had good net games, uh, I only had two players come to Stanford who were already solid serving volleyers. Sandy Mayer would be one uh, who won many major championships in, in doubles. Uh, and Jimmy Grab, who was ranked number one in the world in doubles three different times, was another, two different, three different times, was another one. And other than that, these players, even John McEnroe, preferred to stay in the backcourt. And with his great hands, I would have been a derelict coach not to insist he come to the net every chance he got. And so this was what I was kind of known for, and uh, I was, I would take anyone, even if they were four feet, and, and by the time they got out of Stanford, they were a servant volleyer. And this started to change probably mid-90s. I started to get players who were more comfortable staying back, and the game was changing a little bit. The first, the only player I ever had win the national championship, not as a servant volleyer, uh, was Bob Bryan in 98, and he won it staying back much of the time. He did serve and volley still, but not on every point. Alex Kim in the year 2000, much the same. So that game was starting to change. Uh, the open stance forehand, now the open stance backhand, hitting the ball harder, strings are changed a little bit, um, the rackets are a little bit different, uh, lending themselves to that style of play. And the game changed, and it was, it was uh, no, that was a factor a little bit in my leaving coaching when I did. Uh, the style that I was really good at was going out, and I was, it's pretty easy to adapt. You adapt in every sport as things change. But, but uh, I made my bread and butter as a certain volley coach, and, and I was good at it. What, did you, what would you attribute the changes? The style, you know, the style of play has gone from, you say, from a servant volley style of play to more, more of a backcourt uh, yes. base, baseline style of play. What were, the, what were the reasons you think there's been those changes? Court's got a little slower. Even the grass at Wimbledon is slower than it used to be. The ball bounces a little higher. Uh, Clay court tennis became a bigger thing. When I was started coaching, there were still some schools like Columbia who still played dual matches on clay. Even the NCAAs at Princeton were on clay. But uh, gradually, all the, hard, all the schools became hard court schools, so it really lent itself to serve and volley. They were faster then. Now they've got acrylic surfaces that they mixed in with sand. And depending on the smoothness of sand, the granules, the size of the sand, they can be made so the ball hits and sticks and bounces a little higher, which is slower, which is the trend, or smoother where they hit and skid. Uh, when I started coaching, most everything hit and skid. Uh, I remember playing exhibitions on wood at Foothill College in San Jose State against Rod Laver, against Ponce Segura, against Poncho Gonzalez. And Poncho Gonzalez had the fastest serve in the world. Well, can you imagine returning that off of the wood surface? It was quite a challenge. Uh, but, this, but the courts changed, but even more so, the strings have changed. And the strings hold the ball a lot more, so you can put more spin in the ball. 
So then you can let the ball drop a little bit, play a little farther behind the baseline, take a little bigger swing, and put a little more oomph into it, which caused more open stance forehands. As the ball was hit harder, you had to recover a little quicker for your shots, and the open stance forehand lends itself a little bit more to that. So the game made big changes primarily because of the equipment, meaning the not so much the rackets partly, but mostly the strings they were using it, holding the ball a little longer, and uh, partly because of the court speed. Uh, I, I venture, however, everyone all of a sudden, then when Borg came out, everyone started at two-handed backhands. Borg and Connors, everyone started at two-handed backhands. But you're seeing a lot of great players now at one-handed backhands again. Uh, Pete Sampras won the U.S. Open, serving in volley against Andrea Agassi. And I think the only other serve in volley at the time was Pat Rafter. But he won it against the field that was all staying back by serving and volleying. So I th even with the string. So I think it still can be done. And I would kind of love to coach and, and see if I could revolutionize it again a little bit in some way. Was the, you mentioned the fact that the, the, um, the hard courts have become slower. In general, a little In general. slower, yeah. Was that a conscious effort, or was that just the result of, of materials they used? To Ma materials. They used to be concrete courts or plain asphalt, but originally concrete. And concrete, you'd have to sandblast it to make it slower. It was really a big process. Uh, and, they, and concrete played fast. And uh, uh, the, you get a better quality of tennis on a little bit slower court. We just redid ours here, and we did it slower than we've ever done it before. It'll be interesting to see whether, how the players react, how mm -hmm. the weather games change even more. Now, you developed as, as a as servant volley, or you, <coughs> you were a big advocate of the servant volley game. What did you see as the advantages of that, game, of that style of play? Well, the, for me, I, I want to be proactive. I want to dictate the point. I want to, I want to make the other player react to me rather than me have to react to him. And this was the way you do it. You, you put him on the defensive quicker by getting in that a little bit sooner. And that was my philosophy. Yeah. Of the players you coached at Stanford, who were the ones that st stuck out in your mind as, tr as really effective servant volley players? Well, the two that came in from scratch who were good serve volley players because they've been taught such and actually played that way in the juniors, the best two were Jim Grab, and the only two really were Jim Grab and uh, Sandy Mayer. Uh, the rest really had to be encouraged to do more like John McEnroe, although he, did, he got semis at Wimbledon before he came to Stanford by serving and volleying, but he would prefer to really stay back, uh, encouraging John to come in all the time. And, and the rest of them teaching them the volleys and the transition area shots so that they would be able to do it, not if their size allowed them to do it more. And that was really a fun teaching progression for me. The nice thing about college tennis is that you can, in, in college tennis, you can talk to players as they're playing their match and say anything you want. So if I'm teaching you, you know, you get a little naked when you serve a volley. You, you come in and you're at the net, but the guy can pass you and you can't do anything about it, no matter how, sometimes no matter how good a shot you hit. So you're afraid to do that. You just stay back and just try to outrun the guy. Right. That's how you're taught as a junior. That's how you start to, do, to learn tennis. Um, but if I'm telling you, I, I know what you could do maybe more than you do it, you get in a match and it's tight and you're afraid to, to do something you're not really so sure of. And yet if I'm telling you to do it, then you have to do it. So I could force these guys to do it in their matches and then gradually became part of their game. When you're coaching the players at Stanford, um, are you teaching them, spending time teaching them technique, or spending time, are you spending more time teaching them strategy, or, or what was the, what, would you consider a technical right. coach versus a teacher coach? How, well, how would serve and volley would be technique, because you, you have a return of serve coming in behind right. it. Um, I, 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 th I think I, I tended to err on the side of trying to make strengths more like to take weaknesses and make them better. Uh, I tended to neglect making a strength better. I think today if you have a big serve and a big forehand, you try to make that better and you don't worry so much about the back end or something like that. I think that's obvious with some of the players today. But my, my fault maybe would have been that I would spend more time trying to correct the, the weaknesses rather than accentuating the strengths. Mm -hmm. You recruited, you know, many of the best players in the country to come to Stanford. Um, 
what were the significant coaching challenges you faced in, in coaching this high quality players, these kinds of players? At, at first, I, I didn't have much confidence in that. I, I wasn't that great a player myself. I had a, I had a gut feeling what I wanted to do. Uh, but as I did it more and more, I became a more believer in myself and my style and what I was trying to do, and it became easier. Um, it's not easy to take someone who's never served in volley. I, Jimmy Gerfine reached the finals of the NCAA championship against Tim Mayotte, a teammate who he, where he lost in three sets. But he was a little tiny kid from New York, a big back quarter, a lot of top spin, played way behind the baseline. But he got to the finals and he played Tim to a standstill, only serving and volleying, as an example. It was game changed completely. Uh, so it, it could be done in three or four years, or even two years, but not really in one year. It takes a long time to be able to do that. But I think having confidence in what I'm doing, as I got more confidence, it was really important. Uh, I think the players realized that they could do it. Uh, we were successful doing it. Um, when they went on the pro tour, they were successful doing it. So I think one thing kind of gradually built on another, and pretty soon it was the norm. When you had these highly talented players, I mean, tennis is a game where you have a number one on the ladder, number two, number three, and you have some very talented players. Was there ever a, issues or challenges you faced in, in dealing with, for lack of a better word, players' egos? And, and of course. How, how did you manage that sort of process? <laughs> Sometimes not too well. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the challenges of taking individuals uh, in, a, in what now becomes all of a sudden to them a team sport, yeah. high-level team sport. And... Uh, uh, I know my wife had a hard time with this because she would hurt someone's feeling by playing them down or not showing sure up. You know, on the one hand, as a coach, you're trying to build someone's confidence. Johnny, great job. That's exactly what I want. And the next day, you're saying, but Johnny, you're going to play number three today instead of number two. And, and these guys, ha they wouldn't be where they were without belief in themselves. They have to have that confidence, that inner confidence of what, they, of what they can do and what they can be. And so this is obviously uh, the biggest, I think, maybe the biggest challenge in trying to make it a successful team sport. Um, all of this team was very close and still is to this day. Uh, I, I say my two greatest teams were 20 years apart. One was 1978, and on that team I had John McEnroe, who had just reached the semifinals as a freshman, before a freshman year of, the, of Wimbledon. The defending NCAA champion, Matt Mitchell, defending NCAA champion, who was local, Palo Alto, another Northern California player from Orinda named Bill Mays. Bill Mays, a tremendous talent, uh, a year older than Matt, rivals in the juniors. Each one of them was number one in Northern California in every age group, uh, one a year ahead of the other, um, and ended up losing in the semifinals to Indians Blaze to John McEnroe in three sets. Uh, and the fourth player, a guy named Perry Wright from Beverly Hills, who was the number 12 player in the country in his senior year. And then behind them, I had three players. I had a, an African-American from LA who was very, very good on a need scholarship here at Stanford. Um, a fellow from New York, Peter Rennert, good friend of John McEnroe's, fiery guy, tremendous belief in himself. And a guy from New England who was also a very good, or from the middle states, a very good player all vying for the fifth, sixth, seventh spot. And a guy named John Rast, who was also very good in that mix as well. well <laughs> I'll never forget, we took our spring break together with both of our teams and trained down at Pajaro Dunes, a neighboring resort. And uh, we all lived in the big house together and the guys who cooked breakfast one day, the girls the next day, we had a great time. But we played ladder matches to determine our team positions there. And my guys were having fist fights on the court, and I had to have the girls' team stop practice, come over and call lines for the gals. My wife has never let me forget that. And uh, a very competitive team. Uh, when I, I, in that particular year, I elected to take the three guys, Bill, Matt, and uh, John McEnroe, and have them play uh, each other to see who would play number one in our first competition of the year in February against in the National Team Indoor Championship. Well, by all rights, the matches could have finished up in that little round robin with each player with a one-on-one -on -one record. 
However, John McEnroe won two matches in three sets, both of them. Billy Mays lost to John in three, but he beat Matt Mitchell in three sets. So Matt, the defending national champion, is now number three. Perry Wright gets the chance to challenge Matt because he earned it. Matt tanks to Matt Perry, and so Matt starts the year as defending champion at number four on the team. In the meantime, the bottom three or four guys are having, they have grew up in the juniors as rivals. They're having all, all the freshman class having a big rivalry over themselves. That team, when the national championship ended, we won the final point. I sat on the bench with a towel over my head. I took a big sigh and just thanked the world that we did not self-destruct <laughs> because uh, we weren't clearly the best team in the country. We had some really close matches with UCLA as an example, but we won it with a team that should have won it, but it could have self-destructed. Ironically, those players off the court were good friends and are to this day. Uh, trans fast forward 10, 20 years in 1998, I have a team of four, I feel, four number one players. This team had three number one players. I have four number one players. I have the Bryan brothers who have been number one in the world from 2003 to 2016, at least sometime during every one of those years. I had uh, Paul Goldstein, our current coach, who was a leader on four straight national championship teams, first time that had ever been done, and a fellow named Ryan Walters from San Jose who was a great player. Uh, I had a couple other players, five and six, who were very good as well. I sat them down, I said, guys, how do, how do we want to do this? Do we want to, do we want to play each other for these positions, or how am I going to decide a lineup? They said, coach, you just decide. So I said, thanks, guys. <laughs> So I go home that night and I look at my schedule and I have 24 matches. And I have four guys I consider who are capable of playing number one. So I come back the next day and I said, okay, Bob Bryan, uh, I'm going to play you number one six times. I'm going to play number four six times, number three six times, number two six times. Paul Goldstein, I'm going to do the same thing with you. Ryan, the same thing with you, same thing with you. But remember, and here are the days right now three or four months ahead of time, they should be playing number one or number four and who it'll be against. And I gave them each number, uh, equal number of times against top teams and against lesser teams at each of the positions. I said, now you realize what's going to happen. When you're, it's your turn to play number one, you're going to be playing, the number four guys going to be playing better than you. So you have to be, because you'll change during the year in terms right. of how you're coming along. Can you buy into that? They said, coach, that sounds great. And the number five and six guys I felt were pretty even. One of them became, Alex Kim became the NCAA champion like two years later. The other one, Jeff Abrams, who now is our team, or not our team physician, he's head of sports medicine here at Stanford, uh, was a great player, a national championship in an age group growing up. I alternated them an equal number of times at number five and six. So fast forward, this team stuck to it all year long. This is the 98 team. 98 team. I could have never have done this with 78 team. The 98 team, and then they lost a total of three singles matches. Right. If you take six matches that are played times 24, it's 142 or something like that. Whatever, we lost three matches all year long. Two of those matches were redeemed the second time the player played that player. The third time they never replayed the player. It was an incredible performance, but two completely different teams. It was a coach's dream. So my job is to get my team in the right order, and then I have to decide how to do it. Do I do it with challenge matches? Do I do these couple of guys and these six guys? Do I have everyone play everyone? I did it differently every year for 38 years. Um, but for some reason, in the end, it always worked out. And, and uh, that, that's the toughest job I think a coach of a, of a really good team has, in any team, basketball being an example, football being an example, to keep your team together, playing together as a team and have him make those lineup decisions. Now, over the years, did any of these top players who you brought in and, you know, uh, uh, indicate to you any kind of d disappointment? They said, geez, I, I thought I'd be playing number one all the time, but now you had me playing number four, any of that nature? They, they were always telling me where they should play and how good they were. Right. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing was, that's okay, that's part of coaching. And I have a pretty thick skin, so uh, we didn't always agree. I had. 2003, we had a chance to win the national championship, and I, I had a player, I told him he was going to play a certain position. He said, well, if you play this guy ahead of me, I quit, and he did. And we're still friends to this day, but that just 
what happened. I mean, they, egos do get in the way sometimes, and I couldn't overcome that one in the, at that time. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a hard job, but that's part of the job. Okay. For any coach, it's the hardest thing. One of the issues that you see in college sports uh, today, and you, you, you touched upon it here, is the, the incident of a player turning pro before graduation. Tell us about how that issue or problem existed with, the, with, the, with the, the tennis program and how you went about dealing with it. I'm gonna go back one step. Okay. Uh, one interesting phenomenon, and it's happened more since I stopped coaching. I never had a coach, a, I never had a parent come to me and lobby for his player should play in the lineup. The world today is such that parents are lobbying, I think, uh, a lot. And uh, I don't see that because I'm not on a court, but I see it in high school sports and college sports and the parent, parental involvement. Parents didn't even just go to the national championship. Now they bring an army, a family army, to every big competition. So that was something when I was coaching for the most part that was not a factor. Hey, let, let me follow up on that point. Uh, one of your players I spoke to uh, mentioned the fact that oftentimes the players at Stanford would also uh, actually have their own private coaches who they'd worked with through the years, up to the juniors and what have you. To what extent was that an issue when you were coaching the players? Well, I think one of the first things I would do if I felt someone was really, really close to their coach is to call their coach and ask him his advice or her advice on, number one, what were they doing with this player, what they feel the player had to do to get better, and how were they doing it? So I'd have a head start with the player before I'd go in. I wouldn't try to change something immediately and arbitrarily. I could kind of ease into it. and. I had a pretty good relationship with most of the coaches, so that was that was very helpful to me. Uh, some, in some cases, the parents were the coaches. I learned more from Sandy and Gene Mayer's dad than from any other coach I ever saw. He would come out every spring to, in essence, straighten his kids out from what I had told them and where I had them, yeah. and I would just sit on, and I that was fine with me because my job was to be sure my team got better and they could do it by listening to the dad. I would sit right behind him, and I learned a lot about coaching by listening to their father. Uh, I probably owe him as much as anyone to any successes I ever had as a coach. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting concept that way. And I th but I think that was a, it's very important to communicate with the coaches and, and at least be on the same page because when the kid goes back home in the summer or break, he's going to be working with that person. Sure. Now let's go to this question I asked you just a moment ago about uh, this issue of the college players turning pro. Yes. Uh, to what extent was that an issue that you had to face? Was it a challenge? And how did you go about dealing with it? Well, we've talked about Roscoe Tanner being right. the first one, and, and that was the only person I tried to talk out of it because he was, it was a program that he really single-handedly had almost by his presence built up into a contender and a favorite for the next year. And I felt that, I felt, and I think he felt, he really wanted to be a part of seeing that through. And, uh, uh, and when he was turning pro, he gave that up. Um, so I did try to talk him out of it, not so much because we were going to be that good because I felt you know, he owed it to himself to see it through. Uh, but from that point on, you know, a kid's going to do what he's going to do and, and the agents in those days starting out would, you know, to try to get the kid to sign with them, they'd be constantly telling the kid how good they, that he was, how good they could make him. If he would sign now, they could guarantee him spots in these, these tournaments that his company represented or put on even, uh, that they had a contract waiting that would be this the number from this company. It was a no-win battle. Uh, there were players who turned pro that I felt weren't ready that actually did very, very well. Other players who, who stayed in school who could have turned pro. Uh, some players turned pro that I thought would do great didn't do well, so it worked both ways as well. So, you know, you don't really know for sure, and so I'm glad I didn't try to advise them all and say this is what you should or shouldn't do. My job was to sit down with the players and point out the pros and cons and not try to influence them. Uh, whole, all of them, all of them, I don't think I ever had a player take more than, uh, even take an extra quarter to graduate. I thought it'd be an insult if they couldn't graduate in four years, if they stayed in school four years. So none of them were behind in school, and none of them left for that reason. Uh, if they left, it was because they really 
felt the next step. They were ready for the next step and ready. The money in tennis got bigger. It wasn't a factor when I started. Uh, motivation was a factor because there was no money to get better beyond college. So motivation, my biggest problem starting out was trying to make <laughs> my team, tennis is important to my team as it was to me. Uh, but then when pro tennis came and by the early 70s that had changed. And so motivation, I never had to worry about motivation with these guys. They were self-motivated, which was really great. And a luxury that many coaches wouldn't have. Uh, I, 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 I don't, I couldn't really look a player in the eye and say, this is what you should do because of this. If you don't stay in school, your life's going to fall apart. Uh, if you don't get your degree, your life's going to fall apart. Uh, I think you go to Stanford to prepare for a profession, but that usually means graduate school. So it's not simply a matter of getting a degree. Usually that means you're going to go to med school or law school or business school afterwards. So just getting your degree from Stanford by itself wouldn't necessarily be that important. Uh, so I couldn't say that. They have had the experience of being around the people, the environment and everything. That's where most of the learning at Stanford takes place, I think, for most people. Right. Uh, so I, I couldn't say morally it was necessarily wrong. Uh, I am very proud of the fact that a good number of these players, like Tim Mayotte, uh, like Jim, uh, who else? Uh, Tim, gosh, it must be a dozen of them have come back, even 10 years later, and have graduated. Jared Palmer have come back and gotten their degree and graduated from Stanford. Martin Blackman, head of player development, uh, got his de degree from American University because that's where he was living at the time, but Nick Saviano got his from a school down in Florida, but they all did get their finally to get the degrees. Now, whether that getting that degree has actually made a difference in what they do in their life mm -hmm. by taking an extra year of school, I don't know. I can't say that. Uh, but but I, am, I am proud of the fact both men and women who have turned pro, uh, a, a good number of them have come back and gotten a degree even 10 or 12 years later on their own expense. Now, now the school can pay for that expense later. In those days, you could not. In those situations where you had a player yeah, a top player, you know, leave to go pro before they had played the four years. How did you go about to address it in terms of, you know, backfilling or, or finding talent to replace that player? Well, it, it really wouldn't happen until after the NCAAs and the player won the NCAAs or did really well. Then they would do it and by that time it was too late to pick someone up to take their place right then. Right. So in the years where we didn't win the championship oftentimes because there were two or three guys turned pro all at once and we couldn't fill the holes that year. Uh, I remember there were a couple of times where in, in those days, many of those years, they automatically picked 16 teams based on how they'd done during the year to compete for the championship. And there were a couple of years where he won it. Players thought they'd done everything they could do. A couple of them turned pro and we weren't even invited to the plays the next year. But the year after we won it, twice. Two years we weren't invited after winning it, but the next year we came back and won it. And I'm really proud of that because we were able to reload, so to speak. But we couldn't do it immediately because we were a player or two short and you couldn't pick up anyone that late. Yeah. And I wasn't a good enough coach to make up the difference with, with my ad. Tell us how you would typically conduct your practice sessions and you know, in terms of you focusing on what sort of things would you focus on? We you deal with uh, strength training, things of that nature? Two parts to that question. Right. Uh, first of all, I, I, I am very, very organized. I had a little four by six card. I had every day who was playing with whom for what period of practice, who was sitting with whom. Uh, what I wanted to work on, usually in about 20 minute intervals, that's about right. Uh, we didn't usually play sets in practice, especially when we got into the season because we were playing three matches a week. It was more drilling, uh, whether it be hitting against a ball machine, working on a low back end volley for one guy, or whether it was uh, something like that with someone else. It really made a difference when we finally were able to hire an assistant coach. About halfway through my coaching career, we were able to hire an assistant. And then it made a lot of difference because if I'm working with you, I got 10, 11 other guys out here. I have no clue what they're doing, but I'm really focusing on you. So when I had an assistant, one of us could work with an individual or two, and the other person could run the general practice. But before I had an assistant, even when I did, I would usually run 
I would be working on situations that occurred, like uh, for 15 or 20 minutes, we would work on coming in off the return of serve, giving a player only one serve. You had to come in behind the return and play the point out that way. And maybe after five minutes, we'd have the winner go up a court, so we had a different partner. The loser go down a court, so he had a different partner. We'd mix your team up that way. Uh, we worked a lot on situations, or uh, if I had an individual had something to work on, then uh, I'd pull him outside, but it was hard to do that when I had only one coach. In fact, a lot of my guys would go and take work on a special thing from a local, local pro. In fact, a couple of my players, Jeff Aaron's one of the players, a player who started the EPAP program here, uh, got off the tour and was a very good teacher. And a lot of my players would go to him for help because I had the whole team and I couldn't give them that individual help they needed. So that was very helpful to me and to the players when they had that option. Okay. Um, to what extent did you know, fitness training, was that involved in your practice, if at all? Thank you, that was the second part. Uh, I never stretched in college and never pulled a muscle. You never stretched in those days. Uh, you never, never lifted weights in those days. Um, when we started doing it, I did it because everyone else was doing it only. Uh, that meaning, meaning running, uh, and running or strength training, whatever. And, and we didn't have a coach. I was the one. I, so. My wife, when she did her master's degree after, after leaving Stanford as coach, and then before going back to Menlo College as coach, she did her uh, thesis on strength training and did it for me so that I would be able to have a syllabus and what I would do that would be most applicable to tennis. Mm -hmm. And so I would do it for a while. And then finally we got strength trainers, and then we had conditioning people, whereas I used to do it, have them run. and try to study up on what it was, uh, but uh, I wasn't really big on strength training nor conditioning, and if my strength trainer or strength coach took more than 30 minutes to do what they had to do, I'd, I was not happy and would let them know that. Uh, we have four hours we can spend on tennis each day. I never spent more than two and a half hours in a court. We would start at 2.30, we'd be done by 5, and they had them till 5.30, and then I want them out of there by then. So we used a lot less than our normal amount of time we had to, that we were allotted. And I felt that was one reason we were fresh at the end of the year and always played better at the end of the year. I was very proud of how well we played at the end of the year. What values did you try to impart to your players? You know, you have to be yourself, but I think you have, I think self-responsibility is really important. Uh, if a person was late, he was late, uh, but I wanted to know about it. Sometimes you get held up talking to the professor, fine. But they had cell phones then, and I wanted to know about it. If they weren't going to be at a practice, I wanted to know about it. I was very lenient in term, those terms of whether they were there or not, or, or late or not, as long as I knew, because that affected my practice, what I had mapped out. I think that, uh, I think that having fun is really important. Uh, I didn't have team rules for very long, because I learned that once you made a rule, there'd always be some extenuating circumstance. If you have a rule, you have to have a penalty for not adhering to the rule. And I'd have to give a penalty to someone for something that was really not, didn't make any sense. They had a legitimate reason why that rule had to be broken. And, and these weren't very tough rules either, so I stopped rules. And I said, uh, your responsibility is to do nothing that's going to embarrass your family, your team, and the university. And that's your rule. And, uh, and uh, these guys did a really good job with that, I felt. I felt it was really important to enjoy what they're doing, and I kind of had to set the example of that. I thought, uh, I think my players would agree that we had fun together. Uh, things probably today you couldn't do. It was a different world then. And, but I think, I, I really think most of my players would say they had a, a fun time playing tennis at Stanford. Uh, and, at least I had, I speak for myself, I had fun with them. It was a great age to coach. They're not quite, you know, they know it all, they don't know anything. Uh, they are half an adult, but they're not a, then they're half child. You know, it's a great transitional period in their life to be associated with them. And you know, I think you can have a really big influence on them. I, I, I think another thing, I, I really, I hate procrastination. I hate uh, alibis. Uh, Nike's got the greatest slogan in the world, just do it. Don't talk about it. Your racket speaks. 
So uh, I really, really never wanted to hear an excuse. I never wanted to hear an alibi. I was very, very defining on that. Um, I think that I think you know I, I, I wanted to be proud of what they accomplished, but I, I think we did a great job uh, of of not in your face taunting, uh, looking at a guy, yeah, when you want to point, uh, giving credit where credit was due, doing it in a humble way. Uh, I, I, I'm really proud of the example I set or tried to set, I think I did, in playing our toughest competitors and no such thing. Cal, you don't hate Cal. If it weren't Cal, you wouldn't be as good. Apple wouldn't be as good without Facebook or whatever. You, you know, you competition is really a great motivator if it's done right. And it can inspire you to greater heights. And uh, I think people were really respectful if you talk to any other coaches or any other players we played against, uh, the way we conducted ourselves on the court and off the court, whether we won or whether we lost. And I'm really proud of that as a legacy. And I hope my players learn from that. I think they did. I spoke to several of your players and asked them these mm -hmm. questions. And, and they, I think each, all of them, mentioned the words respect and humility. How would you respond to that? I'd be very proud if they said that. Okay. Is, are those values you, you intended and wanted to impart? To Absolutely. Them? You respect everybody. You, you fear no one. You respect everybody. And whatever you do, you do with class and you do it with, with humility. And I would be very proud of the legacy of that. Okay. What did you see um, as, you, as, as a coach? What did you see your role was in, with respect to the uh, growth, development, education of your players? Well, from a tennis standpoint or from overall? A, Overall, tennis standpoint, you know, my job is to be sure they got better. And I think for the most part, we really did a good job of that. Um, I, th I think that as an individual, and that includes school, that, uh, you know, I think if you, your, your job is to do the best you can for the amount of time and effort you decide to put into something. I can't be the best parent I can be and still have my and do the best job I can do. If I watched all the tape that I should watch or all the uh, scouting I could do, I would go home and wouldn't have a wife. Uh, if I were the best parent I could be and spend all my time doing stuff with my kids and I wouldn't have a job. So the, the premise is you can't be the best you can be. You can only be the best you can be commensurate with the amount of time and effort you're willing to put into that particular thing. But if you're going to do it, do it the best you can for that amount of time. And uh, I think that's, that's an important thing to understand. Are there any accomplishments by your players, players that you coached, outside of their tennis skills that you found particularly impressive or gratifying, such as community service? academic accomplishments, things of that, things of that nature. Yeah, we, we had some guys do very well. We had a Rhodes Scholar, not a, not a starter, a Marshall Scholar. Um, but that's just no normal Stanford student that comes in the realm of things. Um, most of my, it's amazing to me how many of my players have stayed in tennis in some shape or form. Uh, the McEnroe's are two of the best commentators. Jeff Durango, great tennis commentators. Uh, uh, you see guys being successful in venture, in banking, in medicine, lawyer, a lot of lawyers on my team. Uh, I'm really proud of what they've gone on to do. Uh, I, I, I'm, I stay pretty close with about 99% of them mm -hmm. and, and uh, I really value that friendship. Um, got another one having a baby on Friday. I gotta be sure and send a note to his wife today. Um, just, I, 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 I think they've really gone to represent Stanford well by what they've done with their lives. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, four of them, I think, maybe five, serve on the board of uh, the USTA board. Uh, David Wheaton, Martin Blackman, Jeff Durango, Patrick McEnroe, all serve on the USTA board. 
Patrick was the head of player development for the United States, followed by just now Martin Blackman is now the head of player development for the United States Tennis Association. Uh, the ones who stayed in tennis have done a great job. Several have been college coaches. Uh, many of them have been a top profess teaching professionals. Um, I, I, I think the other thing that I try to do by example, I, I try to, by example, portray the importance of giving back. Um, I, uh, one of the greatest honors I ever received at Stanford was, was being awarded the Cuthbert, Cuthbertson Award one year for service to Stanford. I'm a member of elected Stanford Associates as just recently as, as a, a volunteer uh, recognition thing. And then I get a, a then I get a form to give money more money <laughs> the next day, <laughs> but but I think this kind of thing is important and and um, these guys have had a lot of people really invest in them, what their parents have done to get them where they are, the amount of money, the amount of time they go, coaches have invested in them, they can't take that for granted, when they when they go to a tournament. I was preaching, go to the tournament desk before you leave, tell them thank you for letting you play for what you did send a note to the people who, all of them would have to send a note to someone who hosted us for dinner at an event or something of the sort. That was just standard. The first thing we do, we came back, I'd have them sit down and write the note before we even went to practice. Um, uh, I'm really proud of one of my players, Jeff Ahrens. He was uh, a really good player here, a local fellow. Got off the tour, when I played in the tour for a while, got off the tour and came to me and said, Coach, I want to help kids have the opportunity. I." had to play tennis, but kids who wouldn't ordinarily have that opportunity. Do you have any ideas? And at the time, I was helping staff the program uh, in East Palo Alto. They had a recreation program out there. I said, well, let me take you out and meet this guy in East Palo Alto, the recreation director, and see if he's going to need someone this summer and see if you'd like to help out some. And so I just said, yeah, I'd like to look into that. So we did. And the fellow hired him, a nonprofit. And San Francisco was paying the salary of this person. I was on the board of that nonprofit, and uh, so so he 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 did this and formed this program. It's been going almost 30 years. It's 28th year now, starting Coley's Palo Alto Tennis and Tutoring, and it now is one of the nation's foremost programs of its mm -hmm. kind. It was featured in CNN and Dan Rather's Nightly News. A million articles written on it. It was Stanford's Community Service Award winner the very first year they started those awards, and this year, the tenth year of, the, of those awards, they were given a Legacy Award, first and only one ever given, as a, a, to recognize a group from Stanford that had done extreme ex, exemplary outside service. And I'm really proud of this group. That today you come here in the afternoon at 4:30, you see 100 people. And half Stanford students, half kids, another same hundred, another hundred the next day. And um, getting help on one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, I'm really proud that seven or eight of these kids now have actually learned their tennis in, EPA, in East Palo Alto. And have, in those days, we started as predominantly a black African-American community. Now it's primarily a Hispanic community. But have gone on and become certified United States teaching professionals. And they're actually making a living now teaching tennis. Seven of them, eight of them. It's incredible. I'm really proud of that and, and the impact it's had on young, young people's lives. Uh, Stanford Magazine, as I mentioned two issues ago, of, of a gal who, from his, this program, seven years of this program, got admitted to Stanford and just received her doctorate. And, and this is the kind of thing that it's really important my kids see this and feel this. Uh, I've, I've served on a lot of nonprofits on job training advisory board, uh, the board of Peninsula Center for Blind, now Vista Center, things like that. I think it's important to see or set an example of giving back and the importance of giving back to your community. Community. I hope I've done that for them and they picked up something from it. And when you, when you, it tried to, when you explain the, the, the importance of giving back to the community to your players, what was their response to it? I don't think you explain something like that. I think you do it by example. Okay. And you don't talk about it, but they, they hear about it, they know about it. I, I don't think you tell them they have to do this. The one thing, however, I did say to all of them, and I, I, I said, guys, 
You may have been in scholarship. You may not have been in scholarship. Especially for those in scholarship, but for all of you, because you all got new balls each day, you got uniforms each day, you got your equipment taken care of, you got to practice, you got medical care when you needed it. You all owe this program something. And I expect that you all give back to Stanford at some point in time. And it doesn't have to be much. I don't care how much it is, but I think it's a dollar a year. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But you have to give something back. You owe Stanford something. Too many times athletes are all on the street receiving it, and that's all they know. Not by any reason, it's just how it happens. And, uh, and I'm very proud that, that uh, when I look back, we started fundraising for our stadium, uh, the number of donors we have who are former players. By far the largest number of donors to the, athletic pro to the tennis program or to the athletics in general are a high, much higher percentage of men's tennis than any other sport. I think I counted up uh, at one time 66% of our former players had given back to Stanford, the tennis program itself. And I'm really proud of that, where the normal percentage is maybe 20% from all sports. And, and I'm, but on the other hand, I'm embarrassed the other third didn't or haven't yet. I'm still on them. They know that, and I come after them. 